What if I told you that? You will persist after you die. You're telling me I'm going somewhere. Yes. God is outside of time and space. God distributes over time and space, and there's some left over. Time and space is static. It's a display. Okay. Yeah. Imagine that you're a little homunculus inside a computer display, like the Matrix, for example, okay? God not only distributes over that, but there's a whole other domain where God exists. And that's the processing domain. That's the non-terminal domain. We're living in the display of that simulation. In addition to the display, there is also a processing aspect, okay? And God it captures both of those things. He captures both the display and the processor. What is reality? Is reality just stuff out there? No. no. Reality has a mental aspect. And I'm saying that consciousness exists in every part of the universe well, because those are the quanta. Th no, that's, that's what, what I'm asking. Are you telling me that this table is conscious? In that sense, yes. Generically conscious. Are angels and demons real? Yes. God is real, angels are real, demons are real. Is the devil real? Oh, yes. Let me tell you something very important about the man you just saw, Chris Langan. Renowned for his extraordinary intellect, with an IQ estimated to be between 195 and 210, he developed the CTMU, a revolutionary theory about reality. Let me briefly explain what it means. The CTMU, or Cognitive Theoretic Model of the Universe, suggests that everything in reality, from consciousness to physics to God, is interconnected within a system that operates like a self-aware computer, processing and displaying information. Now, let's hear Chris Langan explain this in his own words. If we're talking about a theory of everything, the first question we have to establish, does God exist? Yes. Simple as yes. that. The reality has an identity, okay? The identity is that as which something exists. As a matter of fact, when you say the word reality, you're naming an identity. It is, you're identifying something, this. That's what the CTMU says. It just comes up with the mathematical structure that you need to build a reality out of that, you see? So you come up with that identity and then you search it for its properties. You see, you, once you've built the preliminary framework, then you start deducing the properties of this identity and you find out that those properties match those of God as described in most of the world's major religions. You can deny the existence of God or are its properties such that God definitely has to exist? And the answer is God exists. Has properties exist. of the central substance and central principle of reality, those properties are attributed to God. Including, of course, you know, things like you have the three O's, omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, but then you've also got consciousness. God has to be sentient. We're not just defining God out of existence. Sometimes you'll hear people uh, say God exists, and, and but they'll give God such a, a weak and shallow definition that the God that they're describing has no relation to the God that we conceive of. You're saying, no, God himself is conscious and, and therefore personal? Yes you can establish a personal relationship with God. We're images of God. You know what an image is? It's basically the product of a mapping. God maps himself into each human being. Is your claim a pantheistic claim that God is the universe or the universe is God and that's that? Mm -hmm. Or no, or is God outside of the universe and created? God say, is greater than, well, what is the universe? Reality has an identity that can be studied like anything else that exists. When we examine it, we find three main features. Complete knowledge, ultimate power, and presence everywhere. These exactly match what religions say about God. This isn't just a theory. God is conscious and aware, creating direct connections with humans by putting part of himself into each person. This means we can have real relationships with God, not just believe in him as an idea. The mathematical structure behind this shows that God must exist because reality needs him to work properly. He's not just the concept we created, but the central force that makes everything possible and keeps it working. This leads to a crucial question about how God relates to our universe. Is God the same thing as the universe? Or is God something bigger that includes but isn't limited to the universe? To answer this, we need to look at modern theories about how our universe works, particularly the simulation hypothesis. You ever hear of the simulation hypothesis? Yes. Okay, well the simulation hypothesis is basically the idea that the reality we see around us, physical reality, is simulated on some sort of a, an automaton or, or a computer. God, it's more panentheistic. The idea is that you've got 
the physical universe that you see around you, but God is not confined to the physical universe. Okay. See, there's an ordinary pantheist thinks, assumes that God is somehow confined to the universe. That there is just what we see around us and God is in every piece of it. God is distributed over it. Yeah. Right? But it's, uh, it's a little bit more complex than that because this part of the universe that we see around us cannot exist just by itself. Yeah. Okay? There are certain things that it entails. And when you go into those entailments, that's how you get to God. That's how you get to the identity of reality. But to get back to the simulation hypothesis, that we're living in the display of that simulation. In addition to the display, there is also a processing aspect. And God it captures both of those things. He captures both the display and the processor. What, what do you mean? I, I hate to put it in the end. Well, I mean, okay, here's the display. You realize the display contains states. Yep. Okay, you see things, the objects contain states. States are static. Yep. That's why they're called states. Yeah. <laughs> okay, static. How do they change? Well, they have to be processed. Something has to okay. be processed. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and in the calculus, for example, those are tiny little infinitesimal intervals. Okay, but they are not actually contained in the states themselves. They have a neighborhood, a little tangent space or, or what have you, you know, where you can sort of draw little vectors that suggest that some kind of processing is going on. But the idea of being a state and being a process, those are two different things yep. to the ordinary way of looking at it. It turns out that you can't properly describe reality and causation at all unless you put those things together somehow. And that's what it takes God to do. God provides the processing functionality for your state. The universe works in a way similar to a complex computer system with two main parts, what we can see and experience, the display, and what makes everything work behind the scenes, the processor. This idea comes from the simulation hypothesis, which suggests our reality might be like a sophisticated simulation, but God isn't just part of this system. He's bigger than it and controls both aspects. What makes this understanding unique is that everything we see exists in different states, like frozen moments in time. These states need something to make them change and move forward, and that's where God's role becomes crucial. He provides the processing power that makes everything work together, not just maintaining the universe but actively participating in its operation. This understanding of how reality works leads us to a deeper question about consciousness. How do we we, as conscious beings, fit into this complex system of display and processing? The answer involves something called quantum mechanics and identity operators. Now how do I, how do I make sense of consciousness? Well, ordinarily, quantum mechanics, you know what quantization is? You know, I know the word. Yeah, uh, well, you, you decide what the, the ultimate irreducible objects are. Mm -hmm. It turns out that in order to quantize that theory that I was talking about, that, that theory of identity where you've got the display and you've got the processor mm -hmm. and it's handling both, it turns out that in order to handle both of those things, you need a certain kind of quantum. That quantum is called an identity operator. God is the identity. So obviously these little quanta, they have to be, they, they're doing things, they're processing, so we can call them operators, right? They are identity operators. Okay, the identity operator has, basically it takes input from the outside world, recognizes it or accepts it using syntax, hmm. processes it, and then returns it to the world as external state. That, no, that's, that's what I'm asking. Are you telling me that this table is conscious? In that sense, yes. Generically conscious. It's relying on our consciousness to do it. There's levels of quantum. These are tertiary quanta. They're all put together using physical localistic forces, right? But those are underdeterminative. They don't fully determine what happens. Why? The Heisenberg uncertainty principle, for example, it tells you that the quantum rules, they're probabilistic. Consciousness works through a system of identity operators, special elements that take information from the world process it and return it back. This isn't just about human consciousness. Everything has some level of awareness, even simple objects like tables. The difference is in the levels. Humans have a more complex form of consciousness, while objects have a simpler version. What makes this understanding revolutionary is how it connects to quantum mechanics, where things aren't completely determined but work on probability. This means consciousness isn't just observing reality, it's actively participating in it. The way we process and interact with reality affects how it manifests. This understanding of consciousness naturally raises questions about free will. If everything has some level of consciousness and nothing is fully determined, what does this mean for our ability to make choices? Now, you, you've mentioned two things that raise a 
new question for me, which is you mentioned this idea of simulation, just the simulation or self-simulation, and you've mentioned us doing things. So then it would seem to me we have to tackle the question, do we really do much of anything at all in the sense, do we have free will? Yes, we do. Okay. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. I always thought we did. Well, yes, we have to have free will. Oh, I was discussing with you earlier the, the idea of a fixed array. Okay? Yeah, yeah. All right, now, modern physics know what, basically what you've got is you've got a bunch of quantum fields and superposition, and then you, those fields consist of little fluctuations, little quantum fluctuations, right? Reality is actually generative, okay? It's not a fixed manifold. Everything is being created all the time, not just our states. Our states are being recreated, right? When I look at you, I'm seeing Michael Knowles, okay? I'm seeing you sitting there. But that means that I'm seeing your boundary. I'm seeing what distinguishes you from the external environment. Right, right. Well, it's sort of like a, a, a little baby, right? Has trouble uh, recognizing the limits of things and recognizing what some individual object might be from, you know, the, the glass on the table. They have trouble distinguishing those Precisely. things. Precisely. Yeah. Okay, the baby has to learn to distinguish those boundaries. And it has to receive the, the right visual cues at the right age so that it can actually learn how to do that. Yeah. The concept of free will is explained through modern physics and quantum mechanics. Unlike a fixed, predetermined universe, our reality is constantly being created and recreated. When we observe something like looking at another person, we're not just passively seeing them, but actively participating in creating reality by recognizing boundaries and distinctions. What makes this understanding powerful is how it connects to quantum fields and fluctuations. Reality isn't like a movie playing out in a predetermined way. It's more like a continuous process of creation where we actively participate this explains why babies must learn to distinguish objects and boundaries. They're learning to participate in this creative process of reality. This view of reality as an active, creative process where we have genuine free will leads us to question what happens when we die. So, speaking of this non-terminal domain, in a really basic question, I'm not going to ask you if I'm going to go to heaven or hell, but will I go to either heaven or hell? You will persist after you die. Okay, where you go depends on who Michael Knowles really is. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're telling me I'm going somewhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're confident of that. I don't just uh, evaporate. I don't just turn into oblivion. Well, you can. If you displease God, that's exactly what's going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. God is going to cut you off and he's going to say, I can't see him anymore. Mm -hmm. He's going to turn away from you and then you won't be able to reunite salvation will be impossible for you because salvation means that God has got to pull you back into himself. Right. Okay, but God doesn't want to see you anymore. He doesn't even know you exist. He knows your physical body is there, but he's not interested hmm. anymore because you hate him, you deny his existence, you offend him, so he's not going to look at you, right? So now what happens? Well, okay, you're dead. You still want to live. There's something in you that still desperately wants to live, so it's still going to be there. What happens now? Well, you try to create your own world for yourself, but if you're a bad person and you're an evil person, what kind of world is that going to be? It's going to be an evil world, and that's what we call hell. If we are active participants in creating reality, does this participation continue after death? The afterlife isn't just a matter of belief. It's presented as a logical continuation of consciousness after death. Our existence continues. But where we go depends entirely on our relationship with God. This relationship isn't just about following rules. It's about maintaining a connection with the source of reality itself. What makes this understanding unique is how it explains hell. It's not a place of punishment, but a natural consequence of separation from God. When someone rejects God, they try to create their own reality, but without connection to the source of all reality, this self-created world reflects their internal state. If that state is evil, their reality becomes hellish. This concept of separation from God and the creation of alternative realities leads to question about other spiritual beings and the nature of evil itself. So, we've gotten through death, judgment, heaven and hell, free will and God. Are angels and demons real? Yes. God is real, angels are real, demons are real. Is the devil real? Oh, yes. Yes. Well, it has to be. You know, we were talking about Michael Knowles being surrounded by the medium and, you know, you've got a boundary. Yeah. Well, God has a boundary, too. He's got a very tight boundary. He's perfect. He can't take anything resembling imperfection, right? He, he right. can't take it into himself because that would be a contradiction. Yep. Okay, so God needs an antithesis in order to be properly defined. What is that antithesis? Anti-God or Satan. 
So it definitely exists. Now, Satan isn't coherent because, you know, he, he basically hates existence. Nevertheless, he gains coherence through human beings, through secondary tellers, as they're called in the CTMU. In other words, Satan can nucleate power structures, for example, you know, things like corporations and governments, where you've got people in there that can be acquired as resources, and there's a kind of skeleton, you know, a corporate organization, a governmental, you know, organization that's holding them together, holding them in place, that can be exploited by Satan. The spiritual realm includes beings like angels and demons, but most importantly, it explains the necessity of evil through the concept of boundaries. God, being perfect, has absolute boundaries. He cannot contain imperfection. This necessity for boundaries creates the possibility of an opposite force represented by Satan. What's fascinating is how evil operates. Satan isn't powerful on his own, but gains strength through human structures and choices. Unlike God, who is complete in himself, evil needs human participation to function, often working through organized systems like corporations or governments. This explains why evil often appears systematic and structured rather than just random or chaotic. This understanding brings us full circle to the original question of God's existence, showing how the entire structure of reality, including both good and evil, requires a perfect being at its center.